stuff from completely new people to people who've been around the space for a little while. Very excited to shout out some of the really, really great projects that we love. My name is Dimi Demin. I'm a founder of Alba Texture. We came to Berlin from Zurich, especially because of the hackathon to take Cosmos as one of our available blockchains out there and to give it a try. Yes, uh, this was uh, Algotech was founded at the ATH in Zurich, so it's a student project and we are building internet of buildings. We've been using Cosmos SDK for to put uh, buildings data on the blockchain to make available additional levels of security, immutability uh, in a in a building context. There are basically some some uh, options uh, uh, like a, the full node itself. It's an interesting technology which which is uh, which is attractive to us. Uh, so how you validate nodes, how you validate work, and uh, the proof of uh, work concept is, uh, is quite unique and uh, low energy consumption uh, modus make it even more attractive. There are inter-blockchain protocol uh, which is in development now, so we are really looking forward to see this in action, this is for, first of all. And of course, uh, so the promise uh, what you guys is doing is uh, to, to give some uh, possibility to exchange major amount of data and information uh, in, a, in a network itself. This is uh, this promise we believe in and are really looking forward to see it in action. Yesterday we've been testing uh, the blockchain itself, the protocols, we've been talking to core developers uh, which gave us a major picture of uh, what, what is possible to do uh, with the technology itself and uh, today, like since tonight actually, we've been uh, bringing our development on, uh, on the Cosmos blockchain and uh, so what we've done is uh, it's a working prototype uh, which combines our development which we've done before and uh, so we put it basically on Cosmos. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like a very flexible uh, network uh, so just don't be shy to try things out and uh, have fun. Hello, my name is Alex. I'm from Fluence. Uh, we're making a shared uh, security for the Cosmos zones. 
so to solve the problem when Cosmos zones could uh, lie to the network or to the users, we verify that their uh, behavior is correct, that their state transitions are correct, and uh, if they are not, we are generating uh, fraud proofs and sending them to the Cosmos Hub. I, I mean, when the fraud proofs will be implemented by Cosmos. So, uh, for our te tech stack is uh, mainly it's Scala plus JavaScript. Uh, we wrote a, a, a backend in Scala that uh, that starts uh, the zone apps, uh, the Tendermint zone apps, uh, and then monitors them. The Tendermint connects. Uh, uh, connect as the full nodes to the existing uh, Cosmos apps and uh, our service monitors that their behavior is correct I if uh, uh, Tendermint detects that there's some bad state transition that uh, the uh, state hashes are incorrect uh, it panics uh, in logs and we monitor for that and if that happens we signal that this uh, zone is malicious Actually, we're uh, a little bit abstracted away from Cosmos SDK. We're using it, uh, but to build other people apps. So other people gi give us their source code that uses Cosmos uh, SDK. We build it and we run it inside our Docker containers and we monitor that their behavior is correct. Well, uh, I'm myself uh, not a Go developer. I'm mainly Scala developer and Rust, uh, but uh, I think that uh, I like Tendermint. I contributed to Tendermint uh, a little bit and read a, lo a lot of uh, Tendermint code. Because Smooth SDK have uh, a little bit less experience, uh, I find that it could use some better abstractions, but uh, apart from that, it's pretty much clear to how to use it. It's pretty much okay. Strategy. Mm, I guess uh, just sit in the, uh, uh, before the keyboard and code all the night, all the day. Yeah, and uh, our goal was to produce a simple uh, backend and a simple frontend uh, that could be improved in the future, uh, and just to make a proof of concept that and see how judges and people like it. Actually, I, I liked. Uh, I think I like everything, uh, except we hadn't had time to network. We have a lot of people, uh, I guess it's, it's kind of hard to network when you're coding. Uh, maybe some, you know, some little uh, points of uh, where people can talk on the fixed subject. That would be nice, so some, some whiteboards and subjects and people talking about it and you come to them and there is already a way to approach them. That would be nice. I l I'd like to see my personal two things. Uh, the first one is to include binary hashes to the Genesis block. And, and the second one is a, a little impro bit improved uh, subscription on uh, Tendermint events. Currently, it's kind, kind of hard uh, to subscribe on, on new blocks. So that's my personal okay. very techy problems. Uh, my name is Enrico Talin and I'm the CEO of Commercial Network. Commercial Network is simply put is the documents blockchain. So we created a document a blockchain only for exchanging documents among uh, companies, B2B companies. Um, our main project here it's uh, actually going out a little bit of the comfort zone. So we've been like doing documents for the last two years so we want to dive into the tokens World. So that's our like project in, uh, in during the hackathon. The project uh, it's called Bondino, and it actually it's a uh, yeah very strange name. But anyway, it's uh, it, it talks about the uh, collateralization. So every financial um, any 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 financial product starts starts with some sort of uh, uh, collateralization. So you need money basically to to make money. So that's the point. So money can like value can be anything. So, so we try to create like a multi-purpose, multi um, you know multi-sector token collateralization so you can like bond that's bondino okay bond tokens to use it as a separate value to create some something else actually we started as an ethereum project few few years ago unfortunately i've been like a big ethereum uh, fan since like the very first uh, devcons and uh, unfortunately though it was very difficult for like a 
mainly for the scalability pro problem because we have like talking about exchanging millions and billions of documents actually and unfortunately the scalability is not here yet we will be but um, at least not now so we needed uh, something that will help us actually scale in the way that enterprise company wants to has to be so uh, on cosmos we found uh, an incredible way to actually um, be able to um, open uh, and really uh, scale the project on, on, on an enterprise uh, need. And uh, the other thing that we found is like uh, kind of the same feeling of the community that uh, there was at the beginning of the Ethereum. There was like absolutely fantastic uh, uh, way of people welcoming and it's like, uh, even if it's like big group, but it's very helpful. That's like something that is very difficult to find in communities. Like from, from the SK, uh, SDK, there's like a, a learning curve, but it's way, way, way lower than like uh, the Solidity learning curve. So basically because you can leverage the existing knowledge of, of your own developers, since like with, through the ABCI you can basically write the code in any languages that makes that absolutely fantastic for like the enterprise adoption because you can basically create any software using exactly the same people. Yeah, you, of course you have to change the state of mind because we are talking about like state machines so they have to really change their minds but I think that it's something that can be possible and can be done. The hackathon we listen a lot so we try to understand what was like uh, actually asked and um, I from what I got uh, we kind of like uh, had like a maybe like uh, we being also not only on the hackathon but also being like in the conference for the, the previous two days we have a little advantage because we know that a lot of things was like DeFi, 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 decentralized finance. So we were thinking about doing like, like a cryptology, a, crypto, a cryptographic uh, re-encryption, but then at the, at the end we change the strategy because we know that actually what's needed now for Cosmos is try to create different layers and like um, layers for the decentralized finance. And so since the, it, these layers are needed, we thought let's do the first layer. That's our strategy. Uh, the community and the software has to go together. Uh, there's no such a thing as a software uh, uh, separated from the community. Um, you can write software, but you need like this community support. And I think that what is needed most now that like, you know, uh, you have the time to concentrate on writing and shipping codes and that's like Cosmos being really great in doing it. But then you kind of like to stop and start like focus on also providing support. So. My personal favorite thing would be like having like better documentation and also that's important thing because things changes, okay, migration guides. Because uh, when things changes and needs to change because there's no progress, I, I don't subscribe to the concept of like, let's keep the, the, the freeze. No, 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 things go, must, go home, must go and progress, but please, please, <laughs> let's get, have, let's have some migration uh, in, uh, information. Let's say that uh, the, the other projects uh, needs to try to um, figure out what's missing and doesn't have to be like a huge project because um, uh, hackathons is great because it's a great, uh, a great moment to test ideas and execute them on the same time because this is this like time pressure and there's like this. So uh, actually we were more productive in these two days than like the last month. That says something. So I, I'll, I love to see more hackathons. And the second thing that um, ne just, you know, in general need to focus with something which is doable within two days, actually four days and try to squeeze it into days uh, because of the of the time. So we, we brought like four people and we were able to produce a lot of code. Okay. Thanks. Great. Well, good luck with the hackathon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Cool. cool. So I'm Aaron from a Regen Network. Um, and so our project is uh, to build a domain-specific blockchain for ecological applications. Um, and so we're doing a lot of uh, pilots with people that are um, in the ecology space and the agriculture space. Uh, one of the pilots that I'm super excited about is with the Rainforest Foundation um, to protect uh, the Amazon rainforest and using a number of technologies including remote sensing and blockchain uh, built on top of the Cosmos SDK. So the project we're working on for the hackathon is inspired by our use case. 
Um, we're trying to think about what technology we need to do an end-to-end -end, um, sort of just proof of concept. Uh, so that's sort of like the high level why we're doing the particular things we're doing. Uh, and the workflow that we're looking at is, um, it's, a, it's a very simplified version of something that would be more complex and involved once we deploy it. Um, but basically uh, here we have a, a, a hypothetical farmer who is shifting from conventional practices to regenerative farming practices. And there's a person that is going to fund them, give them funds if they make the change. Um, and that transfer of funds is, is uh, controlled by a verification process. Uh, now in this proof of concept, we're assuming that the verifier is just some organization that it does, goes out of the field and does some trusted verification. In the future, we're working towards um, sort of hybrid um, like field verification slash remote sensing verification of like being able to see from space if the farmer has, has done shifts that we can detect with satellites. Um, but for now, we're just assuming we have a trusted verifier. And so, you know, the end goal is to create a contract that, um, you know, just unlocks the money to the farmer once the verifier submits a claim that details what has happened. Um, but the specifics of what we're building um, have turned into a number of really interesting features. Uh, one of them that I know that a, lot, uh, that a lot of people are excited about is a uh, Wasm VM built on the Cosmos SDK. Um, but it, in addition to that, there's a number of things related to key management and, um, and uh, organizational functionality. Um, uh, and one, one you know, smallish feature that I'm really excited about is feed delegation. Um, I've been told again and again by our design people that they cannot send, we cannot set up a situation where farmers need to go out or verifiers need to go out in the field with wallets loaded with tokens. Um, and so we need to find a solution to that. And a very simple solution is just being able to delegate the fees to um, their like organization. Like I'm a verifier, I work for this company. The company holds the wallet and I can have a live wallet on my phone that has no coins and sign a transaction to, to verify something. Um, and in, in addition to that, there's various um, other you know, group features for managing um, the permissions of the group, for managing keys between multiple devices, um, and delegating permissions from the group to the agents. Um, and then, so that's the first part of it, and then that, you know, you have this kind of organizational setup with the key management, and then it goes into this smart contract written, written in Wasm for now, like um, it's Rust, it's a Rust smart contract that compiles the Wasm. Um, it's an, Definitely a really interesting approach that a lot of people are using in this space. I'm not totally convinced that it's the best approach long term, but it works. There's a lot you can do with that. And um, yeah, we just to, you, we can demonstrate, I think, um, you know, 90% kind of this workflow with this proof of concept we built this. Um, so we have Shane from uh, True Story. We have uh, Ethan who's working for IOV. Um, there's Pedro who's working for Wallet Connect. and. Um, Jihan, who's working for Althea. And they, each of them has a really interesting project. And we've talked in the team about how there's different pieces of this that they see that could work for their projects. Um, you know, and what I take from this is that really looking at what a user, a full user story looks like, can lead you to some of the really interesting technologies we've been talking about. But I think that if we look at them in a kind of holistic way, we can put those technologies together in a way that really serves users and serves adoption. I just feel like it's really easy to, to kind of get to your application, um, you know, the specific things for your application. Um, we are building some stuff on top of the Cosmos SDK because it's, you know, there's things that just don't exist in the crypto space that we feel like we need, but um, just the basics kind of uh, staking and governance is all there and we can just focus on our application. So we don't need to focus on kind of just how we deal with consensus, how we deal with creating a community of validators that are going to actually run our application. I mean, there's, there's a few specific kind of like, uh, you know, pain points, I think, just around like client side support, like um, serialization kind of being available on all clients and, and client SDKs, just so that it's really easy to build mobile apps um, and um, browser apps. I mean, all the other stuff that's coming with uh, IBC is, is really excited and, and I'm looking forward to it and it's needed. Um, um, but, you know, also kind of attention to just like some of the more maybe mundane, just like making things easy to just build a full application with clients and everything would be something that would be great to see. Yeah, I mean, in terms of figuring out what to, what to do, uh, we didn't just settle on the first thing we came up with. We kind of went through a bunch of things and we got excited about each one. And then we kind of looked and we saw what is the one that we're most excited about. and. Um, 
in the end, it was just like this full, this full kind of, you know, full story that ended up in a lot of interesting technologies to support it. And um, yeah, I think my advice would be just like focus on what what is the problem that you want to solve. Like, what do you care about solving? Like, what is gonna what is gonna help you get to your goal of of you know building something useful for for your own project and for people in the community. So everybody give your uh, round of applause for all of the honorable mentions. And without further ado. Okay, um, so let's see, we built a lot of cool technologies, I, I think, um, but I just want to start with the use case that inspired these because that's like, um, that's what ties it together. And so um, the use case is inspired by um, our project, uh, Regen Network. There's other people from other projects here, but um, the inspiration was with our project. Um, so we're trying to incentivize uh, farmers to use more ecological agricultural practices using blockchain. We're building a zone on top of the Cosmos SDK. And there's a number of things that we have seen that our designers uh, that go out in the field and talk to people have told us we need to build in order to be successful. Um, and so um, the idea is that we're gonna have a contract. Um, and we've simplified it a bit, but you know, we have a contract between um, some funders and some farmers. And then there's verifiers that are in between that are doing some verification of whether the farmers are actually doing the ecological land use practices that they say that they're gonna do. Um, and so we need some fo basic form of smart contract. So for that, we um, implemented a WASM VM uh, on the Cosmos SDK for that sort of contract. Um, and the WASM uh, VM can send any uh, message back into uh, the router of, the, uh, of your base app, basically. And, um, and it, has, it, it is its own account, so it has its own funds and it can send those funds itself. But there's a few other things that we wanted to do to kind of really make this work end to end for our users. Um, so um, there's some key management um, issues that we need to deal with, some issues around how a delegation works. Um, so um, let's just, you know, since we are at the contract side of things, uh, the one way that contracts can directly use this idea of delegation, the idea that one account can delegate a permission to another account, is that we want to have a pool of funds that could go out to multiple uh, farmers, and we might want to overextend that pool because we, we know based on past history that not all of them are going to be successful. So we don't want to keep the money in every escrow account. Um, we want to have one big pool of funds. So we use delegation to say, oh, the contract can spend from this other account. We delegate that permission um, up to a certain amount. Um, so we have basically generic delegation of any action in Cosmos um, using kind of like a, an interface for, for, a, for like a delegated permission. And it's interfacing so you can implement any kind of delegated permission you want for any um, interface in, in uh, Cosmos, uh, any, any messages in Cosmos SDK. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Anything. Yeah. Um, so this could be, there's other things that this can be used for. Um, so anyway, another, another part of the, this is key management. So if we actually want farmers to use it and, and, and people that are in the field, like for instance, verifiers, these are people that might be going out with a smartphone and looking around, taking photos, taking soil samples. Um, we want them to have an app that they can sign things and upload it to the chain. Um, and we don't want them to be worrying about key management and whatever. We don't want them to be a barrier to entry. Um, so, you know, uh, there's a few things we implemented. Um, basically, we have uh, one thing is fee delegation. Um, so you can delegate a fee. Um, basically, you can say this, somebody, I can say, you know, I'm, I'm the organization that is managing this whole project. I'm gonna delegate fees to each of my agents, and so they can have an app on their phone, they have zero tokens on their app, a single key, and I can delegate the ability to just spend fees and to verify for our organization um, without, you know, without needing any tokens on their, their device. Um, so delegating that action, and then the contract says, we trust the organization, so we trust the organization's account, and the organization is managed as a group. Um, so there's this DAO functionality there where you have, it's like a multi-sig, but you can, uh, swap and rotate the keys, um, and so that can be used, it's like a group of keys, it can be used either to manage an organization or to manage a group of keys. Like I could say, I want to have uh, two-factor authentication. I want to have to sign from my device or my um, computer. Uh, and then you can use this functionality to do that. Um, so, you know, there's a bunch of different things there. That's kind of how they all tie together. Let's do a bit of demo if we have time. So here we have, um, uh, we have, 
a little bit of UI here. And um, so this is, uh, imagine this is this person's key. We um, did you know, some integration of this with the UI. We want to do more, but it shows what are all the groups that this key is a member of, and what are all the proposals that they need to approve. Um, that's how a group, like a group of keys manages its sending at, um, actions back to the uh, router. So basically, groups can make, can vote on any message they would send back to the Cosmos. So you can have this way of, a DAOs can, can coordinate what functionality they want to execute. Um, and you can see what, what contracts are live. We have this UI defined for um, a specific type of contract, which is the one I'm describing. But contracts are generic. They're in Wasm, we wrote one in Rust. Um, and so uh, maybe we can show an example of, um, if you create a contract, um, so, shortly before we announced that we are coming up here, I decided with Johan to make another contract to see if we could do it and how easy this was. And so, yeah, like the last 15 minutes, we put together a little contract, modified it, and we have an escrow that we had different than we had before. Um, so, I made this thing, I just uploaded it, and I will now, now create an instance of it. If you look at the bottom, it should create another one. And you'll see the difference of it because the state. So if you pull, it's a pull on it, it's uh, the oh, delegated it's directory, yeah. but, okay, yeah, so it's pulling already. Um, if you go to this thing, I just pushed up these new ones, they're different, so you don't recognize them, but if you look at the data, they should show the raw data behind it, right? No, we don't have that, so uh, we should show one of our other contracts. Yeah, I can upload another one then. Um, this was basically, it's a different one, I did different WASM, different state, different everything. I just pulled another contract, uploaded the chain, it ran. Without bugs, Rust compilation feel bit, much better than uh, I would say than uh, Solidity development for me. That was really <laughs> more ergonomic. Um, and uh, it's only the beginning. I think that um, there's a wide range, a wide range of what we can do here. Uh, that uh, yeah, sorry. There's a wide range of how much this can be done. I've heard other people working with them. The interface is just a prototype. So I think we can expand what it can do, plug into the capabilities model, plug anywhere. You can look at the delegated code, I just push that. Yeah, we, we don't need to do that. So um, did you want to show an example of that working in the UI so you can just see how that... Um, the old contract? A few things I might want to just show in terms of... Um, so with, with, with delegations, there's um, a generic sort of capability interface um, that let, let, allows you to sort of delegate. Okay, there's a new one, okay. Um, so there's a new contract here, and then he's gonna, you're gonna make, a, you're gonna be the verifier, and then you're gonna have that contract make the payout. Um, uh, sure, yeah, let's take a question if there's anybody that has something. Um, but I just wanna say though, um, you know, this, this is a u application for Regen Network, but I think there's a lot of other things that can be, that this can be useful, and I think other people in the project, like, have found, you know, other use cases, um, you know, for uh, True Story and whatnot. So, um, anyway, did you send the, any questions? Yeah, let's see if there's any. Um, Too busy coding to pair my uh, CLI. <laughs> Question. Is it yeah. one farm per contract? Or? Um, yeah, generally a single contract would be for one farm. Um, and so the way we do it is we deploy the code once for a contract, but then you can initialize that code with different parameters and create a different contract inst instance. So a contract is basically an account and it would be represent this relationship, but it, it could be for. Um, there could be a crowdfunding one that lets you kind of create your own little escrow thing. Does that answer your question? It doesn't yeah. have to be. It doesn't have to be. It can discuss anything. It's, it's, it, could be a, it could be a co op of farmers, it could be a country. It could be a, yeah. So now this, this, this amount to pay out went to zero because he sent a message to the contract and it, and it sent out, and um, that's all kind of taken care of, not in Go, but in this Rust here, which initializes it with some set of parameters. Um, it can store some state, then um, if the verifier is the one, you know, Cosmos is a verification of the address, but if the verifier was the one that did it, then it will do this send transaction back to the Cosmos uh, SDK. Um, and again, all the delegation works with this. So the verifier, it could be that the actual signer was the, um, the field agent, but the verifier's address here is the organization.
Um, yeah. So I'm Dean Tribble. I'm CEO of the of Agoric, and we are building a smart contract platform for everyday developers outside the crypto space, um, where they can program, you know, with secure composable uh, uh, um, contract components um, in a secure subset of JavaScript. And we're building that on, initially on Tendermint and on Cosmos SDK. And so, and and uh, so. Um, we had started putting all these pieces together, started doing the wiring, but coming here gave us access to all the Cosmos experts. Um, we got to walk through what the architecture was, how it all worked, and find the things that we ought to do differently, fix them, make them, uh, um, you know, debug things, and make it all and make it all come together. So, so, so at the hackathon here, we've had all our pieces come together. So we now have the 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 uh, you know full end to end network of our stuff. We're not doing a lot with Cosmos SDK as opposed to Tendermint. Um, that's mostly an opportunity for us to do things in the future, to interface with the bank. Um, you know, what I like about that ecosystem is it was easy for us to link together so that our um, JavaScript runtime could work with it, and then we could have messages coming in in Cosmos delivered to our, uh, our virtual machine and contracts running inside of our secure environment, and they could turn around and invoke the bank module in Cosmos, and we could use modules modules that, that for staking, and so we don't have to de develop our own staking logic. And as new modules come online, we'll be able to use those. So we'll certainly be implementing IBC directly, because we're partnering with uh, um, uh, ICF and, and all in bits to, to do that. But the fact that our deployed version can instantly use the IBC module is actually quite, quite convenient and really awesome. And, you know, when, when there's bridges to the Binance chain, we'll be able to use those and so forth. Some of what I'd like to see, I think, is there, and I'm just getting well connected in. And so just seeing the other people building in the ecosystem, just seeing the customers outside or the use cases or the users that want to be able to use the ecosystem, that to me is, is, is really important. Um, one of the things I got introduced to at this event was uh, the validator community, which, you know, is, as, a, as a building something, I will certainly care about a lot and need a lot, but it was not something that I had encountered before. And so, you know, that's an example of, of there are things that Cosmos already has, and it's just the bridging and connecting. Um, uh, that, that, that will do. Obviously, I want to see IBC, so I'm helping build it. Um, uh, and uh, uh, so th those are the big things. A chunk of it was how different their perspective is. You know, how they're surprisingly decoupled, you know, and, and so of course they've got a totally different perspective on what's going on, on what's valuable, on what's important. And it, A, makes for a rich community. It certainly makes for, you know, uh, some amount of the right kind of checks and balances of tug of war about priorities, um, but uh, it was interesting to see, you know, what in the things we're building they're excited about. Um, the ability to have a single zone that people can rapidly deploy lots of applications on drives, you know, uh, could drive um, transaction volume in one zone. You know, they're going to do multiple zones left and side between them, but being able to have one which is sort of a default starting point, that's going to be really nice for them. That'll simplify some of their things. And hearing that was certainly exciting for us because it's sort of a nice, oh, we fit that role nicely in this ecosystem. I mean, I was at Hackathon's pre-blockchain. Um, we were sponsors of ETH Berlin last year. So there I was not one of the hackers at the Hackathon. I was, you know, sort of around the periphery. It's the first hackathon that, 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 that I've been doing as much of the hacking as, as, as I have been. And I have, uh, uh, and several of our team are here working on a couple of projects, primarily, of course, the, our platform, but also working with, with, with a few others. So I had a very high level strategy, which, which was if we've solved all of our problems with our infrastructure, then here's projects that we're going to engage other people to work on. And we had a, we, we had a set of those, which we've had discussions about with people so we know where we'll go in the future. We've had um, uh, technical discussions so we understand better what to do. We've gotten people excited about the potential, but that was only if our stuff was all done. Um, uh, and and it wasn't, you know, it, it, it was all done and then we discovered some new things we could do, so we broke it and then, and then uh, this weekend we put it all back together in a better way. And so that was our, you know, that was sort of our fallback focus. I am delighted that that worked. You know, and so that was that. So our strategy was go where all the experts are and all the people that might be interested in your stuff. Good things will happen because 
the difference once there's IBC and not, or the difference once there's our platform and not, you know, is going to be striking in terms of what's possible. So right now, you know, you've got hacker, hackers that are looking at how to support the validator ecosystem. You've got teams that are looking at how to add new zones to do very specific important things, some of which are important and fundamental. Once they're there, they're there. And now the kinds of things people want to build will be more synergistic or higher level applications or so forth. So I think it's going to depend a lot on you know, on when it happens and where the ecosystem is at the time. And that's something, I think, I think a big thing to do will be to pay attention to what is actually being looked for and what the state of the ecosystem is so that they can have a better, a better um, you know, more leveraged runway. I mean, one of the interesting things about the, the community is how many different people are doing things that are not independent, but rather that can be leveraged by other teams. And it's been an astonishingly cooperative group and, 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 and of people both sharing ideas, but also just building on each other's stuff. So, hello, I'm Dean Tribble, and uh, we're the Agorics team, or, or the Agorics team that came to Berlin. Um, and uh, and uh, I'm going to talk about our SwingSent project, which is the kernel for our uh, platform. So, on, on the, don't get out of the way here. So, we're implementing technology at several levels of abstraction. I'll start at the bottom. There are public chains, there, there are uh, public chains like Cosmos, there are permission chains, quorum chains, if you will, like oh, Tendermint, um, solo machines like the one in my phone or this laptop here, and, and we have a model of execution that can span them all with, with uh, islands of synchronous transactional programming connected over IBC and then over our distributed object layer called CAPTP to create a, a, a distributed sea of computation where in those islands we can run smart contracts, digital assets, or other programs. Above that, we build an environment that, that everyday programmers can program in in the secure subset of JavaScript that, um, uh, that, that, uh, that is created by CES. I, and indeed, the Cessify tool I look forward to applying to, our, to, to all of our contracts and modules. And then above that, and this is the, the, the last level of abstraction I'll talk about here, we provide a library, or we will, be, we will be providing a library of components at the market level. So instead of you know, objects and, and, and widgets, you get uh, um, uh, escrow agents, auctions, money, um, uh, uh, derivative instruments, futures, forwards, etc. And you get those as composable contract abstractions that you can build on each other. So the one futures contract can be used and a few, as a future for uh, a gaming token or for a stock or for a, 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 a money token, etc. Okay, so a lot of that we've been building over the last year. That is what our company set out to do, is deliver a platform so that millions of JavaScript developers can build smart contracts in order to help you know, continue the revolution at, 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 at uh, another two art as a magnitude larger. I'm gonna start at the bottom again as to what we did this weekend. Um, so uh, uh, our, our, our man in Canada, um, uh, not shown here, uh, implemented the secure provisioning infrastructure for our test net based on some earlier work by Brian here uh, on the magic wormhole. Um, at the chain level, um, Agoric uh, 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 agreed uh, a couple weeks ago and got together and we're partnering with um, ICF and all in bits to do um, IBC, but we already have an implementation that parallels much of the architecture, and so we have our solo machines, our individual machines, able to um, send signed broadcast messages into Cosmos, and uh, able to watch a state vector for Cosmos and our infrastructure running in Cosmos um, to issue messages through the state vector out and accessible to our solo that via RPC query, via ABCI. So we, we implemented that and got that working. Um, at the kernel level, we got persistence working. So our kernel abstraction, we have a, a abstract kernel abstraction for those containers of, 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 of communicating uh, processes or VATs as we call them. So that's now persistent, so we can kick over uh, any of our solo machines, we can kick over um, uh, the servers and restart them and it'll just continue where the, with where they left off at, a, with trans at transactional boundaries. And we, we did the work at the execution layer to make that work. And finally, we have, a, we have a, a demo that we mentioned in an earlier presentation and Kate will talk about a little bit, but we added the buy and sell capability so that we can buy and sell the digital assets that the demo is about. So, um, so 
I will let you uh, hear. Okay, so uh, you might have seen the Million Dollar Homepage or Our Place previously. So we decided that uh, given the unique affordances of our smart contract layer, what we call the electronic rights transfer protocol layer, we wanted to build a demo that would actually allow us to express those affordances and, and show all the things that you can do with our system that you can't do with ERC-20 or you know um, non-fungible tokens or things like that. Um, and in our system, each of these assets, whether it's money or a pixel or what have you, they all have the same uniform interface and you can use all of these uh, uh, contracts and auctions and all of the kind of economic tools that you can build up with all of those assets, no matter what they are, which is really, really cool. So some of the unique affordances that we have are um, we can build higher level higher order contracts, so that the seat at the table is a token itself. We can also uh, have compound e-rights, where you can divide them and bundle them together. So for the pixel, uh, there's the right to color, right? And then there's the right to transfer the pixel. And uh, we're still in the process of kind of building out this demo, but we have a faucet. Uh, we can put the pixels in a covered call and be able to send invites um, as tokens themselves to that. Um, and it's extensible. So you can imagine that uh, in addition to just buying and selling pixels, maybe you want to buy and sell rectangles. So you can generate your own asset that has pixels underlying it. Um, you might also be able to, so let's see. Okay, so, <laughs> so let's see, we'll change the color. It changed to yellow. <laughs> um, so right now, right now our pixel demo is very, very simple. It is literally 10 pixels across and 10 down. And in order to change it, you use a REPL that uses that allows you to type in the um, the types of commands that you would use to control ERTP assets. So, um, so yeah, that's basically it. And now we'll talk about how it works because it looked that that little bit looked really simple. It was just to show that indeed that's running. It's running in our in, in our platform. It can run under a debugger, all that kind of thing. So the way that we have this set up, uh, on chain, we are running one of our, our, what we call the swing set kernel, the swing set machine. We have another one of these swing set machines on a solo node. And every time that the solo node wants to send a message to the, the, the machine that's running on the chain, it has to generate a broadcast transaction. It has to go and sign a message, send it in. When the chain does its thing and it wants to send a message back out, it writes it out to the state vector. And then that's going to be used to uh, the, the uh, following side, the solo side, is going to pay attention to that output state vector and try to go and write, um, notice that a message is being sent to it. So the demo that we've got here, the green thing on the left is the chain side. It is the one that is running uh, the swing set machine inside it. The thing on the right is the solo side that's gonna be sending stuff back and forth to it. So in this case, there's an early message that it sends in. There's a little bit of too much um, JSON encoding going on here. We're a little bit embarrassed about that. But what's happening is that the, the chain side is able to send a message into the solo side to say, give me the bundle of demo objects, including the faucet from which you can get those pixels, the gallery to which you can send the, the change color commands. And every time one of those uh, gets sent back out, the chain publishes something new into its state vector that then gets pulled by the, the client side. And so when we uh, can connect to this thing and we can send in, you know, there's an object called egg purse and we can say, hey, get your balance. And that is going to generate this signed message, send it in, chain notices it, sends it out, comes back out. Now we have 100 tokens. We can say, hey, um, how about we add a feature to the purse to burn some money? Yeah, just burn 20 tokens. Every, every, every store of money should have some sort of uh, API like that. You never know you might want to use that. Um, and then clearly when we go there and say, okay, let me get your new balance, that ought to be down to just 80. Uh, that's that for that demo. So this is stuff in our GitHub right now. Yeah. Um, one, one note we'll put out here. Uh, part of the, a lot of the work that went into this uh, is thanks to our man in Canada, Michael Fick. Um, we are running the, the, so all of our stuff is JavaScript. We're using Node.js as the, the basis for that right now. The um, process that starts all of this off is a Node.js process. That process is linked against the Cosmos SDK as a library. So the very first thing that the JavaScript process does is do a foreign function interface call over to the Go side and kick off a Go routine and lets the entire SDK run ahead full speed over in that world. Later, when a message arrives, when a transaction arrives that has a message that is routed to the swing set module, that causes a message to be sent back over the boundary into the Node.js side that says, hey, something's happening here. 
That kicks off all of our kernel work, that all of the, the messaging, all the objects talking to each other. The consequence of that behavior, of that action, could be two things. We might change some parts of the kernel storage and that gets saved out to disk. That's something that doesn't have to be replicated, uh, doesn't have to be verified. And then it creates outbound messages. So messages are being sent out to, to other machines. Those messages do have to be verified, so they need to be stored inside the, uh, the Cosmos SDK state vector, or at least hashed in there. So all those have to go back, back over the boundary from node back over to go to go and write that stuff. So we have a lot of messages running back and forth between these, and we didn't think this was gonna be possible until about two or three weeks ago when uh, this employee came on board and said, I can do that this afternoon. Great, so let's, do, let's just do that. And we didn't think it was gonna be great until we got here and got to run through it with the experts. Now, I don't know whether ever anyone noticed while he was doing that demo, something that was a little entertaining to see, where he would type a command, you know, hit character turn, and you'd get a, res a response that would eventually change to the real response. So it was going there as his command was arbitrary JavaScript. Could have been anything. It went to the solo bat and executed in the container, and whether it wanted to try and be insecure or do something bad to the other people partying in that container or whatever wasn't possible. It was then asynchronously sending a message over to the chain that would then dispatch into the JavaScript contract that was the shared contract with other people, you know, in, in, in the real system, of course. And uh, eventually the answer would come back again asynchronously to the solo vat and then asynchronously back to the browser. In all steps there, every single one of those could be killed, brought back up, and indeed we were doing that several times today, and it would just carry on where it was at, and all of the asynchronous delivery and all of the, the, the secure interaction would finish. Yeah. That's it. Thanks. That was uh, 10, 10 minutes. So before, before we leave, wait, uh, questions? Some might be for you. Can I uh, announce that? We're looking for D-Gaming to come get ready while we are taking questions. So D-Gaming wants to come on up already and start setting up. Please do. Any questions? All right, well, thank you very much. And thank you, Cosmos, for having us. Yeah. I am Meher Roy, co-founder at Chorus One. Chorus One is one of the validators for the Cosmos Hub, and we are working to improve the Cosmos ecosystem. What project are we working on? We are working on a project we call Delegation Vouchers. The problem it 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 tries to solve a problem that is going to become really important in six months from now. So if I scan across the Cosmos ecosystem. There are many zones that are building interesting functionality. Right? For example, in Kava, I can bring some assets over to that zone and I can issue a stable coin. There's a compound zone in which I can bring assets over and get a loan from that zone. So my question is, most of my assets in the Cosmos ecosystem are in the form of atoms. And those atoms are delegated to validators. And those atoms are kind of locked. I can't do anything with them. If most of my savings are locked, how will I actually be able to use some of these interesting functionality being, being, being built by the projects? I won't be able to, right? So delegation vouchers is a way of solving that problem. So in this new model, when I delegate to a validator, uh, I get a voucher that represents my delegation. This voucher is fungible. I can transfer it. I can transfer it over IBC to a zone and then so lock that up in the zone and let's say get a stable coin out of that zone. So that's the main problem statement we are trying to solve for. It has a, a, a lot of secondary benefits and we can get, get into that as well. In our case, I think the Cosmos SDK choice is because we want to improve the hub and the hub is built on the Cosmos SDK. But I think the main value proposition of the SDK is that you can you can quite simply build applications in, in Golang and have a blockchain with really great performance. And all of the business logic of your blockchain can be very customized. I think the biggest thing uh, the validator community needs, this is an abstract need, is the ability to differentiate as businesses. Right? So if you think as a delegator, like when you go and see the table of validators today, what are the differences between validators? Well, all of them have nearly 100% uptime. None of them, very few of them have been slashed. 
you find it really hard to judge what's the slashing risk with these validators. The only thing that differentiates them in, in the eyes of many delegates is just the commission rate, right? But if if the comp if the locus of competition between validators is just the commission rate, then that inevitably means that like Coinbase and Poloniex and Bitstamp are going to be the biggest validators because they can offer zero percent commission rates because they don't need to make money on their validators. So, what what would be really nice is to evolve the Cosmos Hub in a direction where all of these validators become differentiated, right? Like they can offer some services to the hub and each validator offers the service in a unique fashion. And so the businesses are, they are differentiated and therefore these businesses can still stay competitive against Coinbase. I think what's missing for the validator community is not some technical tool. We are very capable of building that. It's the business tools for us to survive as a business long run. That is what we seek from the decentralized organization that is the Cosmos Hub. Our project was unique in the sense that we were not building any module. We were standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, the, 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 the Cosmos Hub is already built on the Cosmos SDK and our job was to just take the implementation of Cosmos Hub and like tweak it to have the functionality that we needed. So our, we are pretty simple, we like, like, like two of us folk. So I think like, I think the main work we did was like 15 days before the hack happened, first of all. So for the past 15 days, I have been like trying to build a coalition of people that can actually win the hackathon. I have at this point like interacted with 10 different teams to figure out the right partners. At the end, we, we figured out that Sikka was the right partner for us for this hackathon. We brainstormed a bunch of ideas and then we basically selected this delegation voucher idea because it was practical, it was useful and it was doable on a two-day setting. So I think half the effort was before the hackathon, not inside. Now once inside the hackathon, what we needed was changes to the SDK which were done by two, two people and we needed uh, a UI. So a third person worked on the UI. For the UI, we essentially forked Looney, and we have included all of these, uh, all of the delegation voucher functionality in Looney. Yeah, that's about it. My advice is that, um, first of all, like come into the hackathon very prepared. Um, have your idea already laid out, and not only already laid out, but agreed between the team. Sometimes. Debates can emerge inside the hackathon about what to do, and they can leech a lot of, lot of time. Right, so avoid that. Go into a hackathon with a defined idea with a united team. The second thing I would say is try to build coalitions. Right, like don't, like, just dial people randomly and see what they think and try to build like an interesting coalition because that's going to make your project more interesting and give you a new perspective on what you're building. Hello Cosmos DAO. Yeah. This is this is the hackathon project from Chorus and Sitka. Your two validators on the Cosmos Hub, two of the organs of this great DAO. Doing this project to improve the mothership, the DAO. So just just as an intro, uh, I'm Meher one of the co-founders of Chorus. With me is Joe. He's built like 95% of our validator, a platforms engineer. Felix, research analyst, writes a lot of articles about delegations. Um, he's working to make Chorus the first green validator. We are going to buy carbon credits and offset our carbon impact. And then, last but not least, we have Dev from Sikka. He works with Alessandro Chiesa's group on Starks. And Starks is this technology which will basically change the landscape of scalability in the blockchain ecosystem. Woo! <laughs> 
So yeah, what's our project now? Our project is called Delegation Vouchers, right? So, first a general, I guess, human principle first. Whenever I as a human or you as a human own something, let's say you own a house, we always desire to get more out of the things we own, right? If we have a house, you want to live in the house, but you want to also let out one of the rooms in your house to an Airbnb guest and make some money on the side. Do you not? If you have a car, you want that car to be self-driving so that when I am presenting here, the car can go ferry around passengers and make me money. Multi-utilization of assets is one of the ways economies evolve. Right? We figure out new ways to, you, to develop secondary uses for our assets and improve the quality of life for humanity in general. Now, <clears throat> using this principle, I see a problem that is going to develop for me six months from now. What is that problem? You see, in this room, there are many zones that are building interesting financial applications. You have Kawa that's building a stable coin and the principle behind a stable coin is you load their zone with some asset and you are able to withdraw a stable coin. The same principle occurs in other places like compound, load the thing with some assets and you can extract a loan out of it. This is a very general principle right from most Ethereum applications and like Cosmos zones. But if, if I think of myself, where are my savings in the cosmos ecosystem? Well, they are in the form of atoms on the hub. And right now, they are delegated to validators and they are entirely locked. So here's my riddle to you. My, my savings are in here. The use of my savings is on these zones. But my savings are sort of locked here. How will I actually make use of these savings to power these zones, the things that these zones do? That's what we are solving for, right? So our idea is very simple. Upgrade the Cosmos Hub and make the, change the delegation system of the Cosmos Hub to this kind of model. So imagine you have a validator like Chainflow and Every validator will get like a decentralized automated pool, so the chain flow pool. Now if I as a user want to delegate to chain flow, I essentially send the atoms to the pool. All of the user atoms that want to delegate to chain flow are collected in the pool. It's the pool that delegates, not the user, the pool that delegates. Now when I as a user send my atoms to the pool, I get a few vouchers. So I might send 100 atoms and I might get 50 vouchers. As time passes on, the validator works, push, pushes rewards into the pool automatically and the, the conversion rate of my vouchers to atoms increases. So at the start it might be 2 atoms per voucher but rewards get collected. 5 years from now it might become 10 atoms per voucher. And so if you have this simple system, you can do everything that Cosmos have already does. You want to slash, well, reduce the conversion rate. You want to reward, increase the conversion rate. You want to redelegate, burn the vouchers, create new vouchers for the new validator, and then change the delegation. So we have basically replicated what we know as the staking economics of the Cosmos of today to fit this model. Now, of course, we can do utilization now. Once you have these vouchers, you can transfer them over IBC, sell them on Vasily's marketplace. Maybe that you can do. But then there's a secondary advantage, right? Secondary advantage like this. Today if you think of how rewards are made, so I delegate to a validator, then I get these set of measly rewards every time I withdraw, maybe once every month. I do them for 24 months. Then I unbound and I get my atoms back. So when I get this small set of rewards, that creates this accounting nightmare, right? 
because I need to account for them and then I need to pay income tax on each of these small pieces of rewards. We're going to fix this. So the future state is when I delegate on the left, I get a voucher. Now these small measly rewards, they go to the pool, they don't go to me directly, right? And in the end, three or four years later, I can redeem my voucher for atoms. So I as a delegator see only two transactions, one and two. I need to account for only two transactions instead of 50. And maybe, just maybe, I might be able to pay capital gains taxes on, on these two transactions rather than income taxes as above. Well. I'm not a lawyer, but you know, maybe, just maybe, that might be possible. But that's, you know, that's not really it. That's not even scratching the surface of what this design allows. So this is the one last thing that I want to think about. So, today, the Cosmos Hub has around 6,000 users. We started with 1,000 when the Hub launched. Today we are 6,000. We are going to go to 100,000 next year, are we not? <laughs> yeah. Now, you know the first 1,000 users, they cared a ton about individual validators. These are the users that would like research the infrastructures of all of them and then choose who to delegate. The next 5,000 care a little less. And the next 94,000 are going to care even less. That's my prediction. Right? So, we as the hub, we as the DAO face an interesting question. We are going to have this barrage of new users, each of which is probably going to make less and less research around which validator to delegate to in order to preserve decentralization. So here's how we solve that problem. How, here's how we onboard 100,000 users while decentralizing the cosmos up even further. So you see, once you have vouchers for all of these validators on the left, all of these validators have some vouchers. On the hub, we can have this decentralization pool. And this decentralization pool in turn owns vouchers, some of the vouchers of these other pools. Now this decentralization pool does something very unique. So you see the ICF. The ICF is doing this amazing job at delegating to lots of validators. Care, they care about geographical diversity and they care about decentralization. And they delegate in a way to preserve those properties. So this decentralization pool can basically mimic the ICF's delegation pattern and issue vouchers in return. Right? So, what is, what is, I'll get to you, what is the final thing? I can own these decentralization index vouchers and as soon as I own them, I'm repl replicating ICF's portfolio for myself. I get to eat, I get to eat the cake really. I don't need to worry about how to decentralize and decentralize. There's no mental cost, but I decentralize. So that's the kind of thing that you can build. You have a question? Yes, I do want to say a great financial instrument, uh, very general, but isn't this decentralization tool actually a centralization tool? Yes. Is it following the ICF? Good question. So ICF is going to have competition from Chorus. <laughs> <laughs> they are going to be in the decentralization index scheme. We are going to be in the green validator index scheme. Right? We are going to figure out which of the validators do an environmentally responsible job and Chorus will publish the Green Validator Index. And I invite all of you to create your own index. Together, we are going to outcompete ICF out of this sticking index business. <laughs> yeah, I get back to programming. <laughs> so now Joe is going to demonstrate our implementation via Looney. Good evening. Um, so. I've managed to, to, to go a good uh, 33 years as of last week without having to do a live demonstration. So <laughs> I certainly didn't expect it to be after 39 hours of being awake, spending like a tramp and half cut. But here we are. <laughs> so we've, the, largely Dave and I, and, and our anonymous not Dave, who is 
somewhere in the audience but doesn't want to be on camera, so that's fine. Um, so uh, we've spent the last two days um, implementing this model, not this model, but the previous model, uh, in, in Cosmos Hub. And we wondered how we might, how, how we might show you guys uh, how it all works. And uh, thankfully, there was, a, there was a nice tweet the other day uh, from the guys uh, on the Looney project saying, come and have a look at our code. It's open source. Play around with it. So that's exactly what we did. So here is uh, a nice screenshot of something I created earlier. I sent myself 900 atoms. Unfortunately, not real ones, because that would be far too helpful. And I just want to have a quick check to make sure, yeah, my testnet is still running. Uh, so this, this wallet holds 900 atoms, nothing else in there, it's pretty boring. Uh, I could cash it out and buy some beer, but what could be really interesting is if we go to, to uh, this list of validators, and we've got some, some big ones and some small, some small ones in there, who, who should we validate to? Any, any volunteers? Lunamint. Sorry, Lunamint, I can go for Lunamint, that's fine. So Lunamint currently offline, which is a bit weird, <coughs> because everything was green earlier. <laughs> but we can still delegate to them, because uh, we can still earn, earn some atoms. Uh, so we, we go, go to our, our conversion rate. So our conversion rate at the moment is 1.094. That's roughly, roughly one, one atom to one, uh, one voucher. Oh, it's, it's not long, don't worry. <laughs> um, we're going to quickly send some... So let's, let's, let's delegate 200 atoms to them. Uh, we'll pay the absolute minimum gas price and put in our very, very secure password. What's your password? It's ra 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 ra. And hopefully something green's going to happen. No, 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 it actually worked. And that's amazing because I've been fearing this forever. Um, so if we now go back to the wallet. We can see that we have 91.259 uh, lunar, lunar atoms, should we say, uh, that, we, uh, that correspond to our state position. And it, it worked. That, that is our demonstration. It, it, it actually genuinely works. And I'm thrilled. <laughs> in, 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 in the words of the immortal Zachimanian, staking is DeFi. <laughs> and so, a shout out to David. David's an engineer who joined us very recently. He's built most of the Looney demonstration. But he's right there. Can we get IXO up here? IXO. Simply IXO. Here they come. Cool. Thank you very much, you guys. That was amazing, you guys. Wasm on Cosmos Chains. We have Subkeys. That's like uh, oh, yeah. contract based wallets. Cosm Wasm. Cosm Wasm, everybody. Let's get another round of applause for Cosm Wasm while we get Simply IXO set up. The Wasm and Nuts. <laughs> All right, a uh, little announcement I forgot a moment ago. I wanted to give you a sneak peek of the prizes for the honorable mentions. I uh, wanted to say all honorable mentions will be receiving a ledger wallet, at least one. If you have a big team, you get two. And 100 atoms. So let's uh, round of applause for all the honorable mentions again. Yep. <laughs> All right, so we're going to present uh, Cosmic Bonding. Um, I think Berlin is the right place to do that. Uh, so Cosmic Bonding is a Cosmos uh, SDK module for universal bonding curves. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> this, <clears throat> this uses the the elegance of the Cosmos SDK to provide. Oh, that's not showing. That's my desktop. Okay. So these guys are from Malta. I don't know if that's. Uh, is that Malta? No. Yes? No, mountains. There we go. Okay, so we've got. Um, Cosmos bonding curves, uh, which is not actually showing very well. Um, anyway, so the, the idea was to use the Cosmos SDK to create a, a module which could allow um, any um, uh, parametric bonding curve to be created. 
and uh, to um, use that to launch tokens uh, for buy and sell and swap. Um, so pretty much implementing any of the well-known uh, bonding uh, curve defiant applications such as uh, uh, market makers like Uniswap, curation markets, um, uh, decentralized exchanges, and so on. Um, so there's quite a lot that's left off this slide. Um, so the pricing module should be able to accommodate any range of parametric um, functions. Um, we've implemented um, uh, one of these, uh, but um, through uh, SDK upgrades um, to the, the module, you can uh, apply a new library and that's then available for any of the token uh, contracts that are created or the token um, uh, cosmic bonds that are created. And uh, so what this provides for is the parameterization. So um, you can set up the constants for your bonding curve and then um, uh, update pricing libraries if, if, uh, if, that's, um, if that's needed. Uh, it provides an oracle function and then it provides the buy and sell of tokens or swapping of tokens and um, we've also implemented a, a reference web view, uh, user interface for that. So uh, just to give a shout out to Block Science, um, so Michael Zaga and his team have been doing um, awesome work on um, actually applying these bonding curves within complex adaptive systems. So this is not just about you know, creating an algorithm and then putting that out in the wild. This is really about understanding it within the context of um, of a system with good token engineering. And so, um, depending on the bonding curve and the context, uh, there um, needs to be uh, proper design and implementation. But this gives us the tool set to be able to do that. Sorry about the skewness here, but one of the uh, implementations that we're particularly excited about and working on uh, currently is um, development impact bonds. So development impact bonds raise capital to provide financing for development initiatives such as education. So we're working with uh, UBS um, on a, a project in India with um, education bonds for uh, 400,000 um, to improve the education outcomes for 400,000 uh, school kids across three states. And using this mechanism to uh, demonstrate how we can automate and replicate and make it much cheaper and faster and, and more um, reliable to implement these kind of instruments. There I am there, okay, so, um, so this is based on, uh, just to give it a context, um, the Exocosmos network, which we, we um, launched uh, at Beta uh, last uh, December. Um, so this has some custom modules in it, but essentially this is, uh, would operate as a zone. And the purpose of the network is to provide a verification network. So think about this as creating a state about the state of the world which enables us to then build applications on top of that. So whether it's financing applications like impact bonds um, or a whole range of other sort of service delivery and predictive um, uh, um, uh, and uh, risk management applications and so on that are relevant to sustainable development. Um, so you can go and check out Exo World, um, which is um, an example of the UI that you can create. So this is our reference implementation, create projects with decentralized data stores that are pegged into the Exo blockchain generate claims, get the claims verified, that then can trigger payments and things. So that's kind of the, in a nutshell, kind of what it's about um, with public accountability and, um, and, uh, uh, and transparency around what's happening. So I'm not sure this is really gonna work because of the display, but we do have the CLI where we can show it's extremely easy to set up um, a, a, a cosmic bond, if that sounds really good. Um, and, uh, and to deploy that um, uh, literally within one transaction um, and then to make it available for buying and selling. And so the, this, the, the user interface um, that we developed over the weekend is a basic user interface which, you know, which I think it already takes you know, Uniswap and, and DEXs and so on um, to a sort of different level. Um, so I'm uh, creating a cosmic bond here very easy. I just type in my now the details of the cosmic bond, the name and the the, the address it could use as a reserve, and the various other features. And there I have it created. And now I can use my account to invest in that project if I would like. Uh, oops. What's your password? One, One two, three, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I have invested in the education uh, uh, project. Yeah, and then the 
Yeah, so where do we take it from here? So the um, back to the future now. Um, so uh, the trajectory looks like, you know, the possibility of getting scientific validation, particularly around this um, innovative um, use of the bonding curves for impact bonds. Um, and then testing this out, we have field tests in, in India uh, at the end of July um, and are looking to uh, really sort of go, go live with this module uh, during, uh, during the Berlin, Berlin Blockchain Week, um, the, um, uh, the token engineering uh, uh, event that's going to take place here. We see in the sort of near to medium future the possibility to set up liquid zones in Gaia uh, where you're able to use atoms to stake and generate liquidity for uh, zone um, uh, tokens um, and then things like self-balancing portfolios and so on. It's really elegant, easy to set up, easy to use, and yeah, we, should, we hope that this becomes a core um, SDK module. Any questions? All right. Thank you very much. Let's give another round of applause. Very cool stuff. We have uh, the uh, Insta swap up here as well. Getting ready. Very, very cool stuff. Who doesn't want to use bonding curves on a Cosmos chain? Who doesn't want to collateralize atoms for staking tokens? All sorts of fun stuff can come out of that. Um, does anybody know jokes about space? Does anybody like to Google jokes about space? Uh, awesome. Um, myself and Chad from uh, um, our team started to actually, um, when we heard Sunny on Friday night say, put out the call to do Uniswap, we thought, hey, you know, let's do it. We understand theory quite well based on some, uh, some projects we've been doing for the last 12 months and just observing Uniswap grow to where it is today. And um, Uniswap is one of the largest uh, DeFi projects and very successful projects on uh, Ethereum. So what better thing to do than put it over to uh, Cosmos called InstaSwap. So we'll give you a quick little demonstration here. Um, the theory behind it, because if you don't understand it, it's actually quite simple. Uh, it's a concept product formula. Um, X and Y are balanced in tokens on either side of the pool. Little X is what you put in, little Y is what you get out. So you can have a deterministic calculation of the emission as well as the slip of the pool and the slip of the price. Um, and you can as, essentially make your liquidity fee, so what you pay your stakes in the pool, proportional to slip, um, and that way you create the right incentives for bootstrapping pools, which is slightly different to the, the way that Uniswap work. You can then daisy chain two pools together to basically split the output of the first pool as the input in the second pool in order to basically create a, um, a you know, a, an only a graph of only two hops between any any asset uh, that's in a pool. So let's see it in, in action. Um, this this works. So you come here. First thing you want to do is connect the wallet. So we integrated Wallet Connect. This is a Wallet Connect is a really cool project. Project. We also connect to Ledger. Why not? Because the Ledger team awesome. And um, we did uh, obviously key store and word phrase. Connects it over here. We have uh, the wallet on the left. So these are all the assets that are in my wallet right now. So 230 atoms, etc., etc. And I can now see the pools, and I can see the volume, the depth, um, and importantly, I can see the price difference between the pool price and the external market price, because that's going to incentivize me to arbitrage the pool to, to, in order to maintain the correct pricing. Um, so pools on uh, like constant product pools require the market to maintain the, the price curves. Um, cool. So we'll, we'll go ahead and we'll do a buy. Um, we have atoms, and we want to swap to Bitcoin um, as an example here. This is a very simple interface. So 25% of my wallet or 50%. We can see down here that the slip increases um, when the more we want to trade because our trade becomes more of the debt and pushes the price further in one direction. Um, so immediately after doing a trade and slipping the pool in this example by 7%, so you can, uh, you can just see it down there, um, that's going to incentivize an arbitrage agent to come through and push, push the pool the price the other way. So let's go ahead with the swap. Great, swap done. Um, and now we can see how we can go from Bitcoin to Atom, or even as I discussed, a, uh, a double swap where we go actually from ETH into Atom and then take that Atom and put it into the next pool and spit out Bitcoin, as you can see here. Also, we implemented in the uh, SDK a very simple swap and send. So now this enables you to pay your friends or anyone in any coin that you want, and they can say, hey, can you pay me in this coin? And you go, well, I don't have the coin. And you go, actually, I can just use Insta Swap, and they can. Uh, that you can pay in ETH or Atom and they can receive in, in Bitcoin or whatever the coin they want. So that's swap and send, um, the UI is all functional. Um, the other bit is staking. So how are we gonna solve the incentives for staking? 
Um, so you come to the pool and you've got some unproductive assets lying around. Bitcoin that just sit there on a cold wallet or Adam and you want to uh, essentially deposit into a liquidity pool and earn on liquidity fees. So you jump into the staking interface, you can easily see what you've already staked um, and yeah, you just go ahead and you grab what you have in your wallet and then you stake it, away you go. You can stake asymmetrically as opposed to symmetrically, in which case you simply push the price at the same time as staking. The last little bit of in functionality is to withdraw any earned fees uh, from the pool that you've earned as people trade over top of you, um, or even just exit out, forget the wallet, and uh, now all your assets are being staked in the pool. So now I hand over to Chad, who'll take you through all of what I just showed you there, running from the CLI, um, live on our Cosmos. Okay, so we actually did, we didn't finish implementing the API. Started the backend, so we couldn't actually connect the UI to the backend. But we're halfway there. Uh, but the backend mostly works here. Um, so right now we're just basically um, have some script that's just executing some of the CLIs. Right now it's creating an account with just putting some dummy numbers in there for Bitcoin and Atom uh, coins and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it's doing once for Alice, and now it's doing also for Jack here. Uh, then we do a little query to make sure that all the all the data is in there, correct number of atoms, Bitcoin, so forth and so on for uh, the accounts for that individual. Uh, and then we're setting a stake, so we're we're doing moving some of the coins from their wallets into a stake uh, of their choosing. So in the top one here. We're sending, we're setting into the Bitcoin slash Atom pool, and we're putting in uh, 58 uh, Bitcoins, I think, in 12 atoms. These are random numbers, not actual, relative to actual prices, but they're just random numbers for now. Uh, same thing for ETH, doing some more staking, more staking, uh, and then we are doing a, checking the stakes themselves, so checking the stake for BTC, to see how much Alice put in, how much Jack put in, so forth and so on. Uh, and then we're doing a swap here to, to actually get uh, to exchange from one coin to the other. So at the top here, we're, we're taking, going from Atom to BC, uh, BTC. So we're giving 10 atoms to become whatever that is in, in BTC. And we're going from Alice to Alice. Uh, or we could go from Alice to Jack or Jane or you know whatever else we want to go there. Uh, and then at the end, we see the accounts again and see that we've just can't really see it really well. Uh, that we've got some of the money back out of the stakes, we've, out of the uh, swaps. Very quick, thank you all. <laughs> great job, great job. Can we get the next team up? That would be... <laughs> MetaMask, MetaMask, can we get MetaMask up here? So, very cool Uniswap stuff. That UI, while it connect. Uh, hello, I'm Kamavis from MetaMask. Uh, nice to you all. Um, and so I've been working on a project called Sessify. If you've been watching the headlines, there's been all these hacks of Bitcoin wallets and all these JavaScript apps. Some evil dependency sneaks in there and runs off with your private keys. Um, <laughs> um, and so, uh, Sessify is going to, uh, so when you're, when you're building JavaScript apps and security is really important, like it is in a blockchain context, uh, we need to uh, somehow sandbox these de dependencies and make them less dangerous. Uh, when we saw these hacks come out, there was a lot of discussion about uh, how to do that. And there was one camp that said, don't use dependencies, it's too dangerous. And there's another camp, which I think is ridiculous because the whole like joy of technology is that we can build on each other's shoulders. Or That sounds kind of funny. Uh, but uh, then there's the other camp that says, you have to audit all of your dependencies. And that sounds like a good idea, but that's a thing very large burden every time you want to like make an update of dependencies and whatnot. Um, it's a lot of work. And how far down do you audit? Do you audit down to your operating system? It's, it's sort of like a, an endless thing. 
So the next best option, which was really under discussed, was trying to sandbox the dependencies and make them less dangerous. And this uh, you know, relates to uh, pull up, proof of least authority, and these sorts of things. So, that, so our main goals with Sesify are to, uh, you know, with this, and this is really JavaScript specific in some cases, it's like prevent evil dependencies from modifying, uh, you know, JavaScript primordials like array. So if I, even if I have something hidden nice in a, uh, you know, a little closure, no one can really access it, and I'm iterating over the private keys there, uh, if you modified the array like map function, you could peek at all the elements of the array and see all these private keys. So we can't let you modify these basic things. Um, we also want to limit the access to the platform APIs because that lets you like I don't know, read from disk or local storage in this case and uh, like run off with those private keys and send them across the network. Uh, you know, phone them home. So we want to limit those, those those things. Those two things are given to us uh, by uh, CES. And I'll talk about CES in a moment. This, CES is a project from Agoric. Uh, and uh, so Agoric and Mark Miller have been uh, mentoring me in this project. Uh, and so then the third thing is uh, we need to prevent evil modules from like uh, modifying other modules and sort of like evilly growing through your dependency graph. Um, so, uh, so previously I've been doing some analysis of, of MetaMask and its dependency graph. Um, we have a few different JavaScript bundles, but here's a look into one of them. Um, and this was mostly about size, uh, size analysis. So this is the area of the circle is bytes, um, and we can go further. This is packages, and packages contain packages contain you know groups of modules. So we can go down more granular and get all these little modules and see how they all they all connect to each other. And we can explore that, and that's really fun. So this is something that I've done uh, previously, but I wanted to do this with, from more of a, a security. Uh, uh, and um, so then I was looking at mnemonic. Am I doing it? Nomic. Excuse me. Nomic IO. Dash IO. Yeah, but I actually want the GS tender. No, Nomic Dash IO. Oh, I see, I see. Yeah. Um, so this is, if you don't know, it's a JS-like client for Tendermint blockchain. It's really cool, it's written in all JavaScript. Um, and so this also works in, in the browser using something like Browserify. And so I want to know, what would it be like if we sandboxed it with Sessify? And And so we see something like this. And here the color represents sort of the, uh, maybe the danger level of some of these dependencies because of what global platform APIs they use. Now under Sesify, with the power of Ses, we're able to only pass in the global APIs that we want it to have. We can really control the environment that it runs in. Um, and so then Sesify does some static analysis of the, the code and will generate a config file for you telling you what it's using, what it needs to run normally. So the so, uh, main goal of Sesify is taking existing code and letting it run securely instead of you like purpose building your app uh, from scratch. Start it, throwing everything away and starting over to make it get a secure app. So uh, then using this tool. So this tool is new and what I built for the, for the hack on here. We can see like, why is this red? What, what's going on here? So this is a module called Axios. It's used for HTTP requests. Uh, because it's, you can see it's accessing all these globals. You can't see the specifics, it's not important, but because it's uh, touching network, this is considered very dangerous, so we, we highlight it red. Um, and then you see it. some other things have, like this one's orange, it has a few accesses here, but they're, maybe they're fine. Um, and so the, there's a lot of ways you could view this data. For example, you could view it in like rows in a spreadsheet, and you could sort by uh, uh, dangerousness. But the, it's really important to see it in the graph because uh, while this one gets the, the, uh, these platform globals that are, that are potentially dangerous directly, it could be passing them or passing a rapid version of them to the other um, modules that consume it. So it's important to like, uh, see the neighborhood around these dangerous suggestions. Uh, quick question? <laughs> yeah, show other red because uh, access the, the ways to touch the network 
the idea of access question. Yeah. So and so the other red. Oh, the, you want to see the other red ones? Yeah. What they're doing? Yeah. So let's see. What is, this one is uh, VM Browserify. It uh, has a reference to the DOM. And so it can uh, inject script tags. And if it can inject script tags, it can basically eval code um, and sandbox. Um, this one is using the crypto API. That's probably not too bad, but the crypto API does have a way to store and, and retrieve keys. So that could potentially be dangerous depending on the context. Uh, oh, purple here, by the way, is just this is the like app top level code by the authors. It's presumably trusted. Um, and so then if you are like wanting to audit your dependencies, this can help you prioritize where you need to go. Um, and if you don't, now these, these danger levels are under the context of running in a Cessify build. If it's not running in Cess, these are all red. It's all danger and you have to go after all of it. Um, so really people haven't made at least JavaScript apps like this at all before. Everything is insecure and very terrifying. And I've learned, doing this research of what you need to protect and whatnot, I've just grown more horrified of how many attack surfaces there are on everything. Um, so hopefully we can really uh, shrink, shrink them down. That's mostly everything. And I got one, one for the, uh, the JavaScript nerds out there. I'm going to show the actual Cess kernel, because this blew my mind. So the, the idea that you can run in JavaScript um, things, you know, control what access it has, uh, that didn't seem like that was something uh, possible to be. Um, so I want to I show how they did it. <laughs> Well, he's finding that a key thing, this came up when we were talking to Jay about this, is what CES lets you do is eval safely, which you otherwise can't do in almost any language. But being able to take arbitrary code from arbitrary people and run it in a box and say you can only do this is, is pretty astonishing. Uh, so here it is, here's like the kernel of CES. Um, and it's, it's a with statement around the argument zero here. Argument zero is a proxy. So with statement is whenever there's a, a like a variable re or some reference that uh, goes you know up to this width, it means it will look it up on whatever's inside the width. What they put inside the width here is a proxy. The proxy will programmatically receive anything that tries to do a lookup on it. So now if you try to do you know try to reference anything that would be otherwise accessible, it hits this proxy and they could say like no you don't have access to that or yes you do. Uh, okay, thanks. Uh, questions? Yeah. Yeah, does, does this require uh, all module objects to decide what abilities the modules need? No, uh, these, they, yeah, Sessify generates a config file for you uh, doing static analysis on only the stuff that ends up in your build. So um, if there was some Enoch looking library that needed network access, you would wonder why. Is it yeah, there? exactly, uh, exactly. Yeah. And when you install it and you set up your app, you can generate this config and then you could update later and you wouldn't necessarily have to generate your config. But if you did, you'd see a diff there and you can investigate if, you know, why that diff's there. So like the event stream bug, you know, it was innocuous at first and then it, the, some secondary module asked for vastly more authority than it needed. The thing that's, that, that Cessify does is the first time it runs through and locks everything down to its current level of privilege, but otherwise runs just fine. You can then inspect the parts that are a problem, but if next week a revision of the module is suddenly asking for other things, that will show up as a red flag and won't be allowed to happen. Uh, here's a quick example. Oh, not anymore. <laughs> Uh, here's a quick example of what that auto automatically generated config looks like. We have you know, all the modules, and for the module, we see uh, like what globals they're using, and we get this. Yeah. Uh, so for each module, we have like what globals it's using, and we try to get as explicit as possible because if it was just using this one, maybe it would be fine uh, letting that in. <laughs> and then what modules it's allowed to consume, and if it needs a special environment to run in that sort of thing. But that's all um, 
automatically generated, and you can override it if you want to. Cool. Can we get the rest of the Agoric team up here? And another round of applause for Dean the Human Microphone. Yeah, oh, okay, for, for, for this hackathon, we made the marketplace over IBC for real. Uh, it's based, yeah, it's based on the code that uh, uh, Chris and June uh, pushed just two days ago, so you know it's uh, super fresh. <laughs> uh, yeah, and continued pushing uh, throughout the hackathon, so. Um, Huawei, we, we want to make infra from blockchain gaming. We are making a store for blockchain games, a wallet, a marketplace, and uh, we made, we are making a tender mint hack with built-in uh, BLS random beacon. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, uh, come ask us about it if you're interested after that. So. Uh, why we are building a marketplace? We are building a marketplace because uh, we want to make infra from uh, for gaming on blockchain. Uh, we want to build, m make this infra on Cosmos, and uh, we want to try out like, IDC because it's uh, like crucial for the future adoption. So how it works? Uh, there are two zones: uh, just a random zone with uh, some NFT cap capabilities and a marketplace zone. Uh, user can. Uh, uh, mint a token on uh, Zone A and uh, non-fungible token like a game item or something. Uh, then uh, he can make an IBC call uh, that transfers his token on the marketplace and sets a selling price for it in one go. Atomically. Yeah. Uh, so uh, there is a, that, that's a fine and forget transaction. We we want to make. To, to, to show you that uh, IBC isn't limited to simple transfers, it, it can do a lot of things, uh, including things that uh, can make uh, user experience better. Uh, so, and then uh, another user can buy an NFT on a marketplace uh, and transfer an NFT. Uh, the zones are just bare bones, so on marketplace you can't even transfer tokens, you can just uh, set a price, uh, buy an NFT, and list all the NFTs on sale. That's basically it. And uh, on the zone, you can uh, mint and transfer. And that's it. Uh, so we took us two days. It works. It actually uses the actual IBC code. Uh, after some cleaning up, you can uh, check out how to do an IBC code. So that's, that's like the first example of it. So uh, let us do the demo. Yeah, actually, uh, what I wanted to say is that, like, yes, IBC, IBC is not just bare transfer uh, thing. You can do various things, but the I, I don't know, I don't know if if all of you know how IBC works currently. But um, the idea is that when you when you fire an IBC call that that tells your your zone to send an IBC packet, it's uh, it's not that. The transfer happens automatically, and and you see something on another zone. It's uh, it's all about the relay, and this relay is an external entity that once in a while checks for new packets, on both zones that it is supposed to connect, and then if it sees any packets, uh, it can do arbitrary logic with those packets. So in our case, when 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 zone. Uh, when one zone that, that can, can, can mint tokens uh, sends an IBC packet with the price and the token wants to sell on the market. In our, play, uh, in our, in our case, the, the relayer reads the packet and then just issues a transaction uh, for the marketplace zone. So that's how it uh, basically works. So. Uh uh, we've had some problems with Dima uh, left, uh, MacBook, so we, we are going to show a uh, recording. Sorry for that, but it, uh, I promise you, it's all it works. So.
Yeah, so what happens here is uh, you're working with the, with, the, with the NFT zone, you create a token, uh, you wait for it to actually appear uh, on that zone, and uh, well, there is another token that you, that you create, you wait for it for, to appear, and uh, then, then there comes the, the, the selling part, and this, uh, this send and sell call is actually issues an IBC packet that is checked for by a process that you do not see here, it's the real layer. And then you happen to see that token with all its data and the price on the marketplace. Yeah, then you change the user change the for the user that is going to uh, buy the token and uh, yeah and then we just confirm and buy and, and and this is just this is just a simple transaction no 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 IBC uh, vault yet here so to actually acquire the token on the on, on the on the zone of the buyer you should be able to, you know, like, to, to, to make another IBC call and send another IBC packet, but we were short of time and we could not actually implement that in time. Yeah? So, yeah, this works. Woo! Yeah. yeah. Any questions? Could we have Chorus come up here while we're taking questions just to start getting ready? Any questions? Any questions? NFT marketplace, swapping between zones. Who's ready? Check out the NFT PR on the SDK. Anything else? All right, let's give it a round of applause again while we get chorus coming out here. All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much, everybody. Could we get the judges on the way up here? In the meantime, I want to talk about a very exciting event coming up, unless somebody else wanted to talk about it. Somebody else does not want to talk about it. <laughs> Woo! So if you enjoyed this hackathon and you really want to fly to Seoul, South Korea and participate in another one, it's coming up on July 19th and 20th. Yeah? 19th to 21, what a long hackathon. It's going to be great. <laughs> Check that out. You can see the website at biddle.asia. Hackadam. Go to Biddle.Asia anyways, it's going to be a great conference and you'll see a link there to the hackathon. Anything else you want to say about that? Early registrations, get a free ticket to Biddle. Woo! 35,000 prize pool in Adam, ETH, Bitcoin, maybe still in discussion, but that's the value of the uh, prize pool. And then also, in addition to that, uh, if you actually are the top winner, you'll get a 10-minute speaking spot at Biddle co Conference with over 500 attendees of a de developers, researchers, and VCs. Huge opportunity. All right, without further ado, here are our judges to talk about what happens next. So I guess I'll just I'll speak on behalf here. Um, so yeah, so we had uh, you know a lot of teams come out. I think this was pretty amazing, and we're all super excited about how successful both the the conference was and this hackathon. So huge round of applause to everyone that came out. And it really feels like the start of something special, and uh, you know I know we all just can't wait for what the future has in store. And so thanks to everyone to for giving it your all. So we had uh, you know seven honorable mentions and seven uh, finalists uh, with respect to the honorable mentions, as Billy already mentioned. Um, <laughs> uh, the prizes for them will be um, a ledger for each team. Some teams will get two because they were somewhat large, and a hundred atoms. And then for every one of the finalists, they will receive one thousand atoms. So you may have noticed that that's a, a much larger sum than we had originally budgeted, but we were just overwhelmed with how incredible this went that uh, we couldn't we couldn't help ourselves. So thanks everyone. <laughs> also, uh, quick shout out: um, if you are a father, Happy Father's Day. Uh, if you have a father, remember to wish them Happy Father's Day.
And thanks for coming, but you gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> thank you to everyone who made the trip. This was an amazing week. I think everyone just loved it. So thank you guys. Thank you, Michelle, for organizing.